This episode of All In with Pastor Jordan Easley has been made possible by the generous support of viewers like you. Welcome to All In with Pastor Jordan Easley. Today's message is about to begin, and we invite you to prepare your heart and mind to hear an inspiring message from God's Word. We hope and pray for God to speak to you today as you seek to live your life all in for Jesus Christ. And now, from First Baptist Church in Cleveland, Tennessee, here is Pastor Jordan Easley. Well, today we are continuing a series of messages that we're calling, Who Am I? We're asking the question, and we're discovering our true identity in Christ. And so if you're just now joining us, I want to let you know we're currently walking through the book of Ephesians, the book of Ephesians, which addresses that question head on. And my hope is by the end of this series, all of us are going to have a better understanding of number one, who we are, but number two, who God created us to be. So if you have your Bibles, I want to invite you to join me as we open up God's Word to the book of Ephesians. We're going to start in Ephesians chapter 1. You know, when you begin reading this chapter and really this book, if you're a follower of Jesus that's asking the question, who am I? It very quickly answers the question. And it does so by giving you a series of words, words that define who we are. Paul tells us if we've been saved, our identity has been changed. And we are now in Christ. We're in Christ. He also tells those of us who've been changed by Jesus that we are saints in Christ. We talked about that last week. But today we're going to see Paul continue to find our identity as children of God. And he's going to tell us if you know Jesus, if you love Jesus, if you've been forgiven and changed by Jesus, then you, my friends, are blessed. You're blessed. Shake your head if you agree with that today. You are blessed. That's what it says in verse 3. It says, blessed is the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavens in Christ. The Bible says, if I am a Christian, then I am blessed. You know, modern day Christianity absolutely loves that word, blessed. We love to talk about it, text about it. We like to tweet about all of our blessings. If you don't believe me, just take a peek at social media a little bit later today. It's one of the best hashtags that's used year after year. One of the number one hashtags on all of social media is hashtag blessed. And we use that a lot. Many times we're talking about how we're blessed and we like to use that hashtag to talk about the things that we've done, the things that we've accomplished, the things that we have and we use that hashtag so that we can brag about our stuff and still seem pretty humble about it, right? I mean, that's what we say. I got a college scholarship today, hashtag blessed. I got another unexpected raise today, hashtag blessed. We beat Akron, go Big Orange, hashtag blessed, right? And hear me, the point of this message isn't to change your hashtag game. That's not what we're doing at all, but rather it's to show you what being blessed is really all about. And the Bible is going to talk about that today. If you're taking notes, I want you to jot down this definition. To be blessed is to receive something you didn't earn. It's to receive something that you did nothing to deserve. You know, when we receive our paychecks at the end of the two weeks, very rarely are we going to take that paycheck, look at it and say, wow, what a blessing. You know why? It's because you earn that. You see that as money that you earn, money that you deserve. But let me ask you a question. Has anyone here ever received something that they didn't earn? Have you ever received something that you didn't work for or deserve? That's way different, right? A few weeks ago, our family was having lunch or at a local restaurant. Well, in Ottawa, we were having a meal together. And at the end of the meal, I did what most of us do at the end of a meal. I asked the server if he would bring me the check. We were ready to go. And when I asked him for the check, he said, sir, your meal has been taken care of. In fact, his exact words are, there's another family in this restaurant that wanted to bless your family today, which was awesome, by the way. It was a great day. But as awesome as it was, I am personally, just a word of confession, I'm personally not very good at receiving blessings. Anybody else like that? It just makes me feel a little bit weird. Now, 
I love blessing other people. I'm a gift giver. I want to bless the people around me, but I don't like to receive gifts. It, it makes me feel strange. And I think for many of us, we could say something similar. You know what that feels like? It's great to give something, but when it comes to receiving it, it's just a little bit different. And I started to think about that this week. And really the reason I believe that we have a problem with that is because we don't want to feel like we're in debt to someone else. We don't want to receive something because then we feel like, ah, man, I owe them something. When you receive a blessing, it's almost like there's something inside of you that says, now I have to find a way to pay these people back. A few weeks ago, my family, like many of yours, were, were spending time on Friday night at a local football game. It was a hot football game. Everybody is sweating at this football game. And as we're sitting there, about a quarter into the game, someone tapped me on the shoulder and I turned around, and when I turned around, I saw a friendly face, someone I recognized, a member of our church. And I looked down, and in his hands were four ice-cold bottles of water. And I was like, yes. And he handed me a bottle of water, he handed Audra a bottle of water, he handed my parents a bottle of water. Completely unexpected, completely blessed us in that moment. But you know, about two quarters later, it was the third quarter, and I was needing a little bit of popcorn in my life. Y'all ever get there in the third quarter? You're like, I need some popcorn. And so I look around. I'm like, I'm going to go to the concession stand. And I get up to go to the concession stand. Only this time, I have something inside of my spirit that says, man, you better turn around and ask this guy. And so I turn around and ask the guy. I'm like, sir, can I get you something? And I did that because this guy had blessed me. And I felt indebted to him. I felt the need to pay him back in some way. Now, I should have done that just because I'm a nice person. But the reason, the motivation of my heart wasn't just to be nice. It was like, he hooked me up. Now I've got to hook him up. <laughs> you see, the problem with that is that many of us carry that same mindset into our relationship with the Lord. Think about it. We assume, number one, that, that God doesn't want to bless us. And number two, we think if God does bless us, we're going to have to find some way to pay him back for all the blessings that he's given us in our life. That was the mindset in the city of Ephesus at the time this letter was written called Ephesians. There were about 250 to 300,000 people living in this ancient city and and they were living in a culture that was saturated with false gods and people worshiping all these man-made idols at temples. They're making sacrifices and, and engaging with temple prostitutes and doing all kinds of crazy stuff to appease these gods. Why? So they could gain the favor of the gods and be blessed. Today, we tend to look back at people like that in cultures like that, and we view these people as being unintelligent. We look at them as they, if they were crazy or foolish. But the truth is, many of us are doing the exact same thing today. We are looking for ways to manipulate God so that he will in turn bless us or bless our kids or bless our marriage. Now, we don't make it as obvious as those living in Ephesus in the first century, but, but we still do the same thing today, just in a more subtle way. We think personally, if I'm a good person God will bless me more. Or if I do what God tells me to do in his word, then maybe he'll love me more or, or bless me in ways that I haven't experienced. Or we think, man, if I can give a little bit to God on Sunday, maybe he'll bless me with a whole lot on Monday, right? I mean, many people in churches today live with this mindset that says, if I do this, then God will do that. The only problem I have with that mindset is the fact that that that's not what God teaches at all. It, it's not how God defines how he blesses. It's not the motivation in his blessings. You see, he's not some insecure pagan God that needs to be appeased today. Anything that was owed to God was, was already paid through the blood of Jesus on the cross at Calvary, amen? I mean, he, he, was, he was appeased that day, right? He was paid that day. Jesus paid it all. Now, does God bless us? Absolutely, he blesses us, but not because of what we do. It's because of who we are. Ultimately, it's because of whose we are. He blesses us because we're his children. He blesses us because he's a good father. He blesses us because he wants to. It's his heart. It's his nature. Our challenge is living in the reality of that blessing. 
So somewhere along the way, we've got to go from this mindset of what's it going to take to achieve these blessings to how are we going to pursue God in receiving these blessings? Today in Ephesians chapter 1, we're going to see that through Christ, we're blessed. It doesn't matter what your circumstances may be on planet Earth. If you know Jesus, the Bible calls you blessed. I'm blessed because Jesus changed my identity. I'm blessed because Jesus made me a new creation. I'm blessed because he included me in the family of God. And for those who are in the family of God in Ephesus, Paul wrote to them beginning in verse 1. He said, to the faithful saints in Christ Jesus at Ephesus, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed is the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us with every spiritual blessings in the heaven in Christ. Listen, we're going to walk through several of those spiritual blessings in our remaining time together, and I encourage you to take notes. I'm going to actually give you six things from God's word that says, I am blessed because of this, and I want to encourage you with the first one, which one we've already covered today, but Paul's going to remind us that we are blessed because we are in Christ. Paul says those who are in Christ are blessed, period. Now, if you're not saved, you, you don't know Jesus, I want you to hear me. You can, ex you can still experience good things. In fact, I look around at planet Earth, I see a lot of lost people experiencing a lot of great, you know, great things here on the Earth, temporary blessings in their life. So don't mishear me today. If you don't know Christ, you can still experience good things. You just can't experience God things. And there's a big difference between the two. Paul says only those who are in Christ are going to experience God's very best in their life. And we get to experience God's best if we are in Christ today. In fact, we were reminded just a couple of weeks ago, if we're in Christ today, we are no longer sinners that are defined by our sins, but we are now saints who are defined by our Savior. And let me just put it this way. It is this, our Savior that is the source of every spiritual blessing in our life. The things we're talking about today can't be experienced outside the person of Jesus Christ. And so you say, man, how do I receive all of the blessings that God's talking about? You have to have a relationship with the Savior because he is the source. The Bible says, if I've been saved, I'm blessed because I am in Christ. The second reason that we're blessed is because we've been set apart. We've been set apart. That word set apart or phrase is actually the definition of the word saints. So if you're a saint in Christ, you've been a person that's set apart. He talks about that again in verse 4. It says, For he chose us in him before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless in love before him. Paul says, For those of us who are in Christ, we've been set apart to be holy and to be blameless. We're set apart for a purpose and that purpose is to reflect the holiness of God and the goodness of God to the world around you. Think about the world around you today. And you think about your purpose is to reflect God's goodness to the people that he's positioned you around. Now, people love to debate what Paul meant when he said the words, for he chose us in him. We love to debate that. And the truth is, we're not told exactly who he was referring to. But he was most likely referring to those who believed in Jesus, those who believed that he was the Messiah. But the debate is always two questions. Did God choose us or did we choose God? And I like to answer that question by saying pretty much yes. All right. The answer to that is yes, which which really, I mean, it's a great question. But but that process had to begin somewhere. Right. Either he chose us or we chose him. And so let me give you a great verse that may help clear that up for you today. It's found in Romans chapter 3, verse 11. That verse says, there is no one who understands, there is no one who seeks God. In other words, in order for you and I to be saved and to be in Christ, God had to make the first move. God made the first move. If you're saved today, it's because God met you at your point of need. He forgave you of your sins. He changed you from the inside out, and he gave you a new identity and a new purpose in Christ. Many times we read things like, he chose us, and it leads us to ask questions that Paul was never intending to address. And so if you're having this theological conversation in your head and you're trying to figure it all out, 
let me just give you some biblical principles and some foundational thoughts that come straight from God's word. The first thing you need to know is that Jesus came to save sinners. We see that in Luke chapter 19, verse 10. He came to seek and to save the lost. Now, who is this referring to? It's us. We were all lost because we were all sinners. And so Jesus came to save us. The second thing I want to point out is in 1 Timothy 2, 4. And that is Jesus wants everyone to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. That's a quote from 1 Timothy 2, 4. So it's good to know that I'm included in the whosoever that Jesus came to save. Have you ever thought about that? Aren't you glad that you're in the whosoever? We were sinners needing to be saved by a Savior, and he said, I'm coming to save you. The third thing I want you to notice is that for all those who've repented of their sins and been saved through Christ, the Bible says Jesus came to set you apart for his glory, and we've seen that. We've seen that he, he not only made the first move, like we talked about a second ago, but we were saved not for our glory. Our salvation story is for his glory. So he sets us apart and he positions us to make much of Jesus on planet earth. It's how the gospel was intended to go. He says, if you've been saved, you've been set apart. And if you've been set apart, you've been blessed. The third reason we're blessed today is because we're adopted in Christ. We've been adopted and positioned in the family of God. And let me tell you what the Bible says. The Bible says when that happens, when you become a part of the family of God, it happens immediately. I love that because a lot of us have this idea that we've got to work really hard over the next couple of years, and sooner or later, we're going to become good enough for God. We can earn our way into the family of God, and yet when you look at the scriptures, he says when you, are, when you believe in Christ, you're adopted into his family, and you become a, a child of the king. Listen, adoption is a perfect picture of the gospel. It's what Jesus came to do. And he says, if you've been saved, you've been adopted, and you're not some second-rate son or daughter, the Bible says that God fully adopts us in Christ, and he makes us a part of the family. That, that's what it means. It, that, that means through our connection with Jesus, through our connection to Jesus, that we receive all the rights and the privileges as if we were Christ himself. Verse 5 says, he predestined us to be adopted as sons through Jesus Christ for himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. What that tells me is that before I was even born, God knew I would be adopted into his family. And as an adopted son into the family of God, the Bible says I have a new identity, a new inheritance, and a new mission. If you're saved today, you are no longer a part of Adam's family. You get that? When you were born, you were. When you were born, you were in his family, and you inherited his sinful nature. But if you've been saved, the Bible says you have a new family and you have a new father, and you've then traded in your old sinful nature for the nature of Almighty God. Now, if you're still in Adam's family, you look like Adam. You look like the world. And as a result, the Bible says when you die, you're going to receive his inheritance, an inheritance of sin and death and torment and hell. But when you're adopted into God's family through Jesus, the Bible says that inheritance is canceled and you've traded it in for a new inheritance that comes from God, an inheritance of abundant life and joy and peace. And you receive an entirely different slate of things in a real place called heaven. When we become sons and daughters, the Bible says he's our new father and Jesus is our big brother. He says we are co-heirs with Christ. He changed our purpose. We join him in his mission. And he said, if you're in Christ, you're blessed because you've been adopted. And the fourth thing I want you to see is that we're blessed if we've been redeemed. If we've been redeemed by the blood of the lamb, the Bible says we are blessed. Verse seven, in him. We have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace. Whenever you see that word redemption, it's always going to be connected to the blood of Jesus. It's going to be connected to the forgiveness of our trespasses through the blood. The concept of being redeemed is an ancient word that 
refers to buying something out of market. In fact, when you read this word picture that Paul uses, it's a picture of a slave market. Think about that for a second. He's saying because of the sin in your life, that could be a lot of sins or a little sins. That when God looked at you as a sinner, he sees you as a prisoner, a slave with a debt so large that you were unable to be released from the bondage that you were in. You were unable to break free on your own accord. But then the Bible says through his redemption, God has reversed the curse of your sin. He's restored you. He's forgiven you. And he set you free. That, that's redemption. He's, uh, he's adopted you with his own blood. He's erased your sin debt because the chains were there and he had to break the chains, preventing your freedom. He's now called you son and daughter because you're free in Christ. 1 Peter 1.18 talks about that. It says, for you know that you were redeemed from your empty way of life, inherited from your ancestors, not with perishable things like silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of an unblemished and spotless lamb. He said, you, were, you had an inheritance of Adam and sin and death, and Jesus came to redeem you with the blood of Christ. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 says, you are not your own, for you were bought at a price. So glorify God with your body. And guess what? He didn't come to redeem you out of pity. He redeemed you out of love. The Bible says, if you've been redeemed, and I hope you have, then you, my friend, are blessed. Paul's also going to tell us that, that we are blessed because we're aware of his will. I'm blessed if I'm aware of the will of God. Verse 9 says, he made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good, good pleasure that he purposed in Christ as a plan for the right time to bring everything together in Christ, both things in heaven and things on earth in him. You know, in Old Testament times, God's plans and God's goals weren't as clear as they are now. We now have clarity when it comes to God's purpose. We now have clarity when it comes to the mystery of his will, because Jesus came to reveal that to us. That word mystery occurs five other times in the book of Ephesians, and, and each time it's talking about a truth that was once hidden, but is now made known. See, that's what Paul was saying. Jesus made known to us the mystery of God's plans. And since we are in Christ, we have knowledge of his will. In a world of stocks and investing, we call that insider information, right? That's insider trading stuff. Jesus came to give us insider information into what God was doing and what God was going to do. He came to reveal God's will. See, insider information is when the future plans of a company are revealed to someone before the public knows, before its investors know. And that's exactly what Jesus came to do. See, if you knew that a company was going to make a big move tomorrow, and as a result, that company's stock was going to go up 1,000%, there's a good chance you would want to get in on that deal, right? Shake your head if you're tracking with me. If you knew it was coming, you would want to be invested. In the same way, if you knew that in the next five to 10 years, sometime in the future, a certain industry was going to take off that's not currently taking off, but it was a guarantee that for every $100 you invested today, that $100 would turn into a million dollars a couple years down the road. I've got a good feeling you would move heaven and earth to find $100 today. Amen? Listen, all of us would. And that's exactly the picture of Jesus coming with the good news of the gospel. He came 2,000 years ago with insider information, and in doing so, he revealed to us God's plan and God's purpose. He made known to us the mystery of his will, a plan for the right time to bring everything together in Christ. That's what he said. We hit the jackpot with Jesus. Amen? We hit the jackpot. He came to this earth talking about the kingdom of God, and he told us with his mouth how we can avoid a real place called hell. I'm grateful for that. He told us how we could join him in heaven for all eternity. He came to give us a heads up about what was coming, an opportunity to experience God's very best, not only on this earth, but for all of eternity. But I want you to notice in his word, he doesn't force us to take action on this deal. He doesn't force us to repent or surrender. He doesn't force us to love him or to hate sin. 
But instead, he reveals to us the will of God, and he invites us to believe in him and trust in him. And in doing so, he showed us that for those who do, the payoff is going to be huge. The payoff is going to be huge, not only in this life, but for all eternity. For those who go all in with Jesus, he came to reveal his will to us, that it's going to be huge. Listen, I am blessed today because I am aware of God's will. I want to share one more with you from the words of Paul, and that is, I am sealed. And because I have been sealed, I am blessed. Verse 13 says, in him, you also were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and when you believed. The Holy Spirit is the down payment of our inheritance until the redemption of the possession to the praise of his glory. This is an incredible text because Paul tells us in this passage, the moment you believed, think about that moment for a second. Do you remember that moment? The moment you believe that Jesus is who he says he is, the moment you believe that Jesus is the Messiah, that he lived, that he died, that he rose again, the moment you trusted that Jesus is the King of kings and the Lord of lords, Paul said, the moment you were saved, you were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. Think about that. My word sealed, it refers to an object that finalized an official document. In the first century, most documents were written on parchment paper, after the work was complete, it would be rolled up into a scroll. And the way that they would keep the scroll together would, they would take a seal, they would dip the seal in hot wax, and then they would place that, that hot wax seal on the edge of the scroll, and it would keep it bound together. And that would do a couple of things. It would keep the scroll in place. It would also guarantee its authenticity. And so when it's dipped in the seal, it's really multifaceted and multipurposed. Most of the time, the seal would be from a ring worn by someone with great authority. The seal showed ownership, and it would typically refer to the office of the person that was sealing the document. A seal showed ownership, and you were saying, when you sealed something, I am the one that sent this. I am the one who approved this. In the ancient world, cattle and other animals, and yes, even slaves, were branded. And the reason that they would brand animals and even people was to indicate ownership. But here's the picture that Paul was painting here. He's saying, God was saying, when you were saved in that moment, I'm the one who approved your salvation. And he said, I approve that salvation. And in doing so, I marked you with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the Christian's seal. God seals his people, and in doing so, he does it by sending the person of the Holy Spirit to indwell in us, to take residence in our lives. Paul said the Holy Spirit is the down payment of our inheritance, which tells us that when God saved us, he marked us, and he marked us with the person of the Holy Spirit, and he tells us there's more coming. That's just the down payment of what I came to bless you with. But when God saved us, he marked us. And when we entered this new relationship with this new family, with this new father, the Bible says in that moment, the Holy Spirit came to us and began authenticating the reality of that relationship by making you and I look more like his son, Jesus. The Holy Spirit allows you to do that. Just about every single week, I'll have someone come up to me and after looking at a picture or seeing us in person, they'll say, Pastor, your son looks just like you. And I don't see it at all, by the way. I mean, I've looked. I've studied, I'm like, I just don't, I don't see it. But apparently other people see it. I mean, I had someone tell me yesterday, they, he's got your smile and he's got your facial features and he's got your walk. And apparently I couldn't deny him even if I wanted to. And I want to a lot, right? <laughs> well, but you know why we have similar characteristics? It's because he's my kid. There's no getting away from it. We have similar characteristics because he's been marked with my DNA. And as a result of being marked with my DNA, whether he likes it or not, the kid looks like his dad. <laughs> but you know, the same is true with us and God. Think about this. 
When God saved us, he marked us. He said, I marked you with the person of the Holy Spirit. And in that moment, we inherited the DNA of Almighty God. And as a result of us being marked with his spirit, as a result of us inheriting his DNA, the Bible says that, that you and I began looking more like Jesus the moment we were saved. Let me ask you a personal question today. As you evaluate your own life, as you think about your, your existence here on planet Earth, may I just ask you, do you look like your daddy? Think about it. Do you look like, do you look like Jesus? I just think it's a great thing to think about when you're looking at this and God's telling you that, that you should. The Bible's telling you you've been marked, you've, you've inherited his DNA. I mean, it's a good time to say, does my heart look like the heart of God? Do my passions look like his passions? Does, does my love for people look like his love for people? Do I forgive like he's forgiven? And if not, to ask the question and to be honest with yourself, God, why am I, why am I so hurtful when you're so good? Why, why am I so stressed out and anxious when you are so faithful? Why am I so greedy when you're so generous? Well, why do I love myself when you tell me I'm supposed to love others? I mean, for me, this is a good mirror moment to say, man, if I'm a child of God, empowered with the person of the Holy Spirit of God, if I have the DNA of God, then why doesn't my life look more like God? You see, the reason I, I think we should consider that is because if your life looks nothing like him, then perhaps you don't really know him. But there may be somebody here today that says, man, I've done the church thing, I've done the religion thing, but I've never done the Jesus thing. And let me just put it this way. If you haven't been sealed with the Holy Spirit of God, the Bible says, then you haven't been saved. The Bible says when God saves us, he marks us. He marks us with the person of the Holy Spirit and he changes us in such a way where we can't even help looking like our dad. It's in our DNA. He can't deny us if he wants to and we can't deny him if we want to. You know why? Because we've been changed from the inside out by the one true God and as a result, we can't be the same again. We're a new person in Christ. If you are sealed, you are a saint, and your identity is in Christ. And for those reasons, the Bible says we are blessed. Never take those blessings for granted. If God has saved you, he saved you in a way that only he could. We can't save ourselves. And he didn't do it because he had to. He did it because he wanted to, because he loves you because you're his kid. If you've been around church very long at all, or if you've watched this broadcast before, you've heard us use the term gospel a lot. But there may be somebody that's watching this today and they're asking the question, what is the gospel? So let me just start right there and see if we can give you an answer. Here's what the Bible says very clearly. All of us, because of our sin, deserve death. The wage of our sin is death which means not death like you and I think about death, where it's in a physical sense. It's an eternal separation from God. It's eternally dying. It's, it's death spiritually. That's an eternal separation from the God who created us. And he says that when we die spiritually, we will reside for eternity in a real place called hell. No matter how you think you can get to heaven on your own, it doesn't work. The Bible tells us there's only one way for us to get to God. In fact, it talks about that in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5. It says, there is one God, and yet there's one mediator between God and men. It's the man, Christ Jesus. So the Bible says, if you want to get to heaven, if you want to experience an eternal life of satisfaction and abundance, then you have to go through Jesus. You've got to receive him in order to be saved. Listen, it doesn't matter who you are or where you've been or even what you've done. It doesn't matter if you've been to church a million times or if today is the very first time you've watched a broadcast online. Can I tell you something? God loves you. And God says that you can become a child of God right now. 
You say, Pastor Jordan, how do I do that? How can I take that first step of faith and become a child of the King? Well, you know what it says in Romans chapter 10, verse nine? It says, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and if you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. I love that word will. He didn't say you might be saved. He said, you will be saved. I wonder if there's someone that's watching this right now. Someone within the sound of my voice that said, you know, I've tried to get to God on my own for a really long time. And yet I've been the own Lord of my life. I've made the own, my own decisions for this life. And you know what? I've fallen short time and time again. Listen, if that's you, may I just invite you to close your eyes right here, to bow your head to the Lord and to speak to him plainly and clearly. Maybe you could pray a prayer something like this. Just tell him, Jesus, I need you right now. I know I can't save myself. I know there is nothing I can do by myself to experience an eternity in heaven. But God, I know that you gave your one and only son for me. And knowing that in this moment, in the best way I know how, I wanna ask Jesus to step out of heaven and to step into my heart and to change me from the inside out. Tell him in this moment, I am willing to repent from my sin, to turn away from the things I've been pursuing and turn to you as my sole hope for life on this earth and for all of eternity. God, thank you for loving me today. Thank you for not giving up on me, but thank you for saving me and making me new. Now give me the courage to live for you. Give me the courage to follow you and never to be ashamed of you in my life. And it's in Jesus precious name that I pray. Amen. Listen, I believe that there is someone today that went all in with Jesus Christ. Hi, I'm Jordan Easley, senior pastor of First Baptist Cleveland and also host of All In, where I have the privilege and the joy of sharing Bible teachings with you every single week, right from the Word of God. I'd also like to take a moment and just invite you to sign up right now for my free daily devotional email. Uh, that email is sent out every single morning and is designed to help you begin each day refreshed and inspired. The information needed to register for this free daily devotional email is showing up on the screen right now. So please sign up and look for your first email to arrive first thing tomorrow morning. Hey, thank you for connecting with me today. And please know that you are such a blessing to us as we strive together to live a life all in for Jesus Christ. This episode of All In with Pastor Jordan Easley has been made possible by the generous support of viewers like you. We hope and pray for God to speak to you today as you seek to live your life all in for Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ.